Thank you, Gio, for opening up our space and helping to ground our community for today's conversation. Talofa Lava Highland Community. Oloingoa Edwina Fui Olo Tama Fiel Ifui Sao Mailin Uo Savayo Polu. Ma Olotina Fala Fui Sao Mailin Uo Tula Tutuila. Hello, community. My name is Edwina Fui. I use she, her pronouns, and I will be your host for today's conversation. I am super thrilled and excited to, to introduce our friends and our guest speakers for today. Um, a little bit about our speakers. State Representative Jesse Johnson is a lifelong Federal Way resident um, and, and a graduate from the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Masters of Education. Go dogs! Uh, Jesse's values are rooted in equity, inclusion, and social justice. His focus comes from his close partnership uh, within the community in the South King County region, where he has worked as a high school career and college um, counselor and in workforce planning and development for the Highland School District. In 2017, Jesse was elected the youngest city council member in Federal Way history when he first took office at the age of 27. Now he serves as the legislator's youngest member where he works to help working families and seniors struggling with high costs, students looking for the right pathway to a good paying job, and families struggling with housing insecurity across the state. Addressing youth violence prevention and expanding behavioral health services are important issues for, John, for Jesse. Uh, stemming from the work he championed on the Federal Way uh, City Council, just recently elected back to the State House of Representatives, Jesse will serve as a vice chair for the Public Safety Committee and a member of the Com Community and Economic Development Committee. Um, our next uh, presenter, uh, Epiphany Nick Johnson, is a second year medical student um, at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She graduated with a dual bachelor's of science in biology and bachelor of arts in American ethnic studies from the University of Washington. Her values are addressing the health needs of marginalized communities with an emphasis on intersecting identities, particularly the needs of black and Samoan, LGBTQIA plus youth. She also has a passion for destigmatizing mental health conditions and co combating racism in the medical education, which leads to adverse health outcomes for black and brown communities. Epiphany is now preparing for clinicals in her medical school journey. Today, I'm excited for the Johnsons to share with our community on racial equity, moving from commitment to action. Highland family, I know you're out there. Um, show your love in the chat and let's welcome Jesse and Epiphany. Woo! Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I love seeing that photo. That was pre-COVID and, and my hair was much more content and uh, I think COVID has taken its way with me, but uh, thank you so much, Edwina. Um, I know Epiphany is gonna share screen for our presentation. Well, it is an honor to be with you this afternoon, a day after an historic inauguration. I just wanna first salute Highline College for your visionary leadership around racial equity work. Uh, now we will move to Epiphany, who's gonna do a quick land acknowledgement as well. And uh, thank you all for having us. Thank you, Gio. Uh, for the land acknowledgement that uh, you moved us into. I just want to reiterate what Gio said and um, just really remembering that we're all on indigenous land and land that was stolen by force and by genocide and um, want to take a moment to honor the original caretakers of this land who um, are still here and to invite folks if you would like to take one of those um, things for moving from commitment to action and visiting www.realrentduwamish.org and consider uh, taking the action uh, of honoring indigenous folks with money, financials, something that will actually um, help them. Um, sometimes we Think, you know things like our thoughts are good and acknowledging them as good and also taking that action to the next step is very good thank you so much epiphany for that that is that is crucial uh, we will now move into what i love to do when uh, we're presenting is ground ourselves in commitments for this presentation and so the first one is to stay engaged don't let your heart and mind check out it's very important for today uh, number two is to listen for understanding, truly listening with an open heart and an open mind. Uh, number three, experience discomfort. Agree to experience discomfort so you can 
uh, learn about these issues of race in an honest way. We know this is an emotionally charged topic, but really experience that discomfort and be okay with it. Uh, number four is speak your truth. Once we get to questions, be honest about your thoughts and feelings and opinions as you're hearing us speak today and say them in a way that is authentic for you. Number five, expect and accept non-closure. This is probably one of the, the ones that's most difficult for me. Accepting that you may not reach closure in your understanding about race, racism, or race relations. And there is no such thing as a quick fix. Number six, call to action. Uh, reflecting on today's dialogue will impact your current practice, whether you're a student, faculty, staff, or just a community member hoping to achieve racial equity in your own life. Uh, next, we will move to the beginning of our presentation. Thank you, Jesse. I agree that accepting the non-closure is so important and also understanding that this work is never done within our own lives and within community work. We're always coming back to um, be introspective with ourselves. And throughout this talk um, with you all community, we're asking that we would use the lens of targeted universalism as our framework for this discussion and our lens with which we move forward to come to understand this discussion. And what targeted universalism is um, coined by Dr. John Powell, who is a social justice advocate, author and professor at UC Berkeley. It's basically the understanding that if we focus on and provide resources, or additional resources for the most underserved, um, the most marginalized subgroups, that will help all uh, under, underrepresented groups and also help all groups in general. So remembering to really focus and um, understand the most marginalized groups need the most resources. And um, a lot of times globally, these groups are black communities. And so really coming to understand that as our framework for this discussion. Thank you so much, Epiphany. Uh, before we move on to our commitment for racial equity, I wanted to ground us in how we got here as a society. As you can see, I shared a book by Irum e. X. Kendi. I know a lot of folks have probably read his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist from 2019, but this was his first novel that talked about the enslavement of African-Americans in this country. So I really want us to ground ourselves in that. And I would like to make the case for why we must strive to achieve racial equity and racial justice. As Dr. Cornell West says, any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice giving us a sense of the moral regeneration through violence that has led to this point in society. As America was celebrating its independence and liberty in 1820, uh, there was sim similar uh, circumstances where America also inhabited 20% um, of its population that were enslaved at that time. How we as a country have viewed ourselves as civilized folks, whereas the other are the savages, indigenous folks, black folks, and people of color combined with this manifest destiny mentality of our country for a long time. The enslavement of African people, uh, subordination of poor and working people, domination of, of women, gay, lesbian, and trans people. This is what America is founded on. The rule of big money, the rule of big military, and the rule of racist ideals fueling a racist system. That's what Dr. King talked about in his Three Evils of America. This has manifested into today where people have very little sense of who they are without the means of financial capital, rule and domination over others, and their sense of uh, white superiority and black inferiority. And this is the history that has led us to this point and the worst of our power-driven foundation from the very beginning. So I just wanted to reference that and I would love for you all to check out that novel by Ibram X. Kendi. This is the time for us to fight and the time for us to search within ourselves for new possibilities for change. And that's what this conversation is about today. Uh, we can move to the next slide. I also want us to think about our why. This is very important. We are now, I believe, in one of the most prophetic moments in the history of America. Uh, just this year, we have experienced what I believe to be five concurrent crises, a public health crisis with COVID-19 and the global pandemic, uh, an economic crisis with widespread unemployment that we see in our communities and closure of businesses, um, a crisis of safely educating our students and the resulting learning loss from the digital equity gap, 
a crisis of the soul of our democracy with corruption and chaos that's plaguing our leadership from the White House to city halls across this country. And finally, a crisis of racial reckoning which is our conversation today, stemming from our racist history and ongoing systemic racism in our institutions. Uh, and I believe this pain and suffering and trauma has been wide and it has been deep. And this moment calls for us to look within ourselves and to pose that question, what is your why? So this being MLK week, Dr. King answered that question, not just with his words, but with his actions. When they threw him in a Birmingham jail in 1963, he wrote letters that inspired America. He awakened us to the moral consciousness of what it means to truly be free. And that freedom is not just a state, but it's an act. And that silence in the face of oppression and injustice is worse than oppression and justice itself. He literally gave us his life to the cause of civil rights and justice for all of us. And his ideas and legacy lives on today. And that legacy of an unstoppable love of truth and a love of uh, moral consciousness and justice that's why we are here today to spearhead your why. So I just ask that you think about your purpose and why as we proceed today in this conversation. And we'll now move to our vision for racial equity so we can ground ourselves in that. Thank you, Jesse. The why is so critical. I remember growing up and learning about Dr. Martin Luther King and thinking, oh, I wanna be like him. And now being in an adult mindset, it's like understanding if you, you know, want to be like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You have to be willing to give up that uh, that run for financial security, as some may say, or accumulation of wealth. That's that's not what his legacy is about at all. And so, being willing to speak up in spaces for racial equity, knowing that you will lose other things, and a lot of times, those other things are finances maybe friends uh, losing comfortability. And it's all about why, and, and the why is um, linked to the vision. And the vision uh, is about not what we can see. It's not about what we are living currently. It's not about what we see on the news right now. Vision is about seeing forward past what you can see with your blind eye. Some may even say that without a vision, the people will perish. And vision is about peace, joy, love, and community. And if I could even go forward, when I envision what a, a vision for racial equity is, I see a vision of a place where I would love for my, our future children to grow up, where they don't have to worry about their skin color dictating how others treat them or view them within education system, uh, within community, with friends, or whoever it may be. I, I envision a community where I don't have to worry about educating my little children about how they need to act when they're interacting with our police force and telling them what they need to do to make sure that they stay alive, no quick movements. Um, not talking back, all these things, not having the fear of giving birth to children that when they reach a certain age and they go out into the world, that I'm worried about what they might come in contact with just based on how they were born, what they look like and who their parents are in this sense, you know, of, of our culture and saying, wow, I hope my little babies come back home because to me, I always see them as babies. And so vision for racial equity is not about one group being above the other, but about us all being equal. That's all we just want to live. And what that takes, though, is equity, because we can't ever get to this third final step of us all living in Kumbaya, enjoying um, individual characteristics and talents that we all have uniquely without us first addressing what our roots of our problem is. And it, it's racism, it's all the isms. And it's, it's founded in anti-Blackness, as Jesse has so eloquently stated. Uh, and anti-Blackness is not just here in the US, but it's global, unfortunately. And Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. knew that the country li we live in right now is not one of racial equity 
and even now in 2021. Regardless of the inauguration, which gave us hope yesterday, we are still battling with the root of the evil. And I quote um, the good Reverend Dr. King when he said, our country is sick and it is a mess. And he gave his life, his life was taken from him, trying to ver work towards a vision, one where he knew that you would plant seeds and we are called to plant seeds for trees that will grow and have shade that we will never sit in. So what that looks like is working towards that is us interrupting and dismantling inequitable practices, the, all the isms, racism, um, transphobia, homophobia, xenophobia, all these isms um, are all combined with this. And in doing so, we're not asking for us to go forward in what we would call um, performative antics, such as social media things, saying hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter is nice, saying hashtag say her name is nice, but in it, it in itself does not save lives. It does not save folks as they are Black and Indigenous, and Brown folks as they are being shot in their homes, as their lives are being taken in hospitals while they are giving birth. What does is interrupting systems, speaking up in the classroom, speaking up to colleagues, speaking up within our own families and addressing uh, the racism and the isms that we hear from our own community who surrounds us and addressing it within ourselves, within our communities and within the institutions that we work and live within. And then hopefully we can from there build better systems that do not base people's success off of what race they are, what their socioeconomic status is, their gender or sexual expression and maintaining these systems to then be able to cultivate. But first we have to tear down what is there and reform into something new. Epiphany just summarized our presentation right there. <laughs> no, she did amazing. That So I, I really appreciate when she said grounding ourselves in hope because I, I think we have to be candid about the grimness of the reality in which we find ourselves at this moment in time. A lot of folks talk about racial progress, but there's also been a progression of racism in that progress. And yet we still must ground ourselves in hope. In the black tradition, the word hope has always been understood, uh, not just as a virtue, but a verb. No matter what, you have to keep on pushing in the face of tragedy and despair to show up again tomorrow. Uh, you must be in movement, you must be in motion, you have to have momentum. And to be a part of a larger calling that moves you physically, uh, mentally and spiritually to be the best version of yourself. Uh, this translates to always fighting for breakthroughs in that moral consciousness and justice. So our mission to achieve the vision that Epiphany just eloquently stated so well is racial equity must mean closing gaps so that race is not a predictor of one's success. And to close those gaps, we must center communities of color, which we'll talk about in our five steps towards action of racial equity. And moving beyond just services and reconciliation to transformation of policies, institutions, and structures that were made to benefit white communities to now benefit black, indigenous, and POC communities. That's what we must do moving forward in that mission. So I just wanted to say that, and we are now gonna move to our racial equity commitment that we all must make today before we proceed. Now, this racial equity commitment is important. Uh, when I joined uh, the historically black fraternity, I'm really proud of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the same frat as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He became an alpha at Morehouse College. I was asked this question, would I like to join the organization or commit to the organization? Now you can join uh, a club, a sports team, a church, or, or even a movement, but it means something entirely different to commit, to make a commitment to a cause, to a conviction, or a course of action. And I decided to commit, which has its challenges. Uh, but it was a concrete decision and a moment of 2020 clarity for me to do something with 100% purpose. And in order to make this decision personally for us all today is different for everyone. Uh, for me personally, this comes from, from three sources, from truth, uncomfortability, 
and reconstruction of thought. Uh, as someone who has always been inherently curious and observant, this comes from a love of wisdom and a search for truth. Um, in that search for truth, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, like we mentioned earlier, in what you may find in that truth. Mm -hmm. And this causes you to self-reflect and, and almost engage in a critical uh, self-inventory of how you view the world. And this may lead to you to reconstruct the ways in which you think, in which you feel and act in everything that you do. And that starts with listening. Can you listen to even yourself? Are you slowing down to hear your own thoughts? Or are you just taking in information on the news or social media? Or are you reflecting on that information and developing an analysis of what you're hearing? That is the definition of critical thinking, which is super important on an individual level as we think about this racial equity commitment. So I would like us all to really ask ourselves today from an individual standpoint, what is your purpose towards uh, achieving racial equity? And, and what gets in the way of that purpose? What do you need to maintain that purpose? Whether you're a staff, faculty, student, or community member, um, how are you gonna lead with authority on that purpose and your why, as we talked about earlier, towards racial equity? Then as from an individual standpoint, we can move to an institutional level to begin to align around transformative and anti-racist values, relationships, and goals. So that is what this is about in this commitment. And I ask that you all stand with us today to make that commitment so we can begin to move towards acting on this racial equity commitment. Thank you, Jesse. I would like to add that in regard to the vision and the commitment, a lot of us um, are committed to racial equity work because our lives literally depend on it and the lives of our future generations to have a better life and a better outcome literally depends on racial equity, a step-by-step -step more coming into fruition and because it is the right thing to do. Uh, so step one, we're basically examining the ways that we're perpetuating broader systems of racial inequity, racism. This is levels of oppression, which could also be seen as um, levels of racism. So individual words that you have, interpersonal interactions with folks, um, uh, stereotyping, uh, microaggressions. A lot of them that I get usually is if I say to someone that I'm in med school or they ask what I'm doing, and then they say, I hope that nursing school goes well, or they ask what kind of doctor I'm going to be because they see my face and they see just what I look like on the outside. And it's hard for them to match that with, I'm going to be a physician, I'm going to be a doctor treating people. And then there's the institutional level where the institutions we're in, our schools, our workplaces, they have policies, practices, procedures, um, that benefit the dominant culture, which is white culture, and it's to the detriment of uh, the non-dominant culture, which are Black, Indigenous, and um, communities of color. And how we see that is the way that classes are taught is a way. Could be that some folks learn better another way than just sitting on a Zoom session, <laughs> or um, the, the kind of things that professors bring in that are examples that one culture is familiar with, that maybe other cultures, like if we're from immigrant backgrounds, that's not a familiar um, metaphor for us. And so these are ways that um, institutions will benefit the dominant culture and then structurally. So that's overarching, like we're looking at government, the um, incarcer mass incarceration system, overall education systems. And the way that I like to think of these is that they really all work together. The overall big structures have laws, policies, all these things that say, this: these are our norms. This is how we are gonna function and it's to the benefit of the dominant culture. And then because the bigger structure has these norms, the institutions have their norms and we're all moving through these institutions and we're you know trying to make it through and then individually within the institutions, we meet other classmates or we meet other coworkers who may have these preconceived notions. And then it goes back out from 
folks within individually within the institutions, some professors may say something that we say, oh, that's homophobic, oh, that was racist. But because the institutions don't have policies, like in my med school, they have nothing that says that um, racism that isn't super overt is not a fireable offense. So then those professors get to stay there. And then structurally, overall in medicine, we see that racism is pretty much propagated in medicine. And that's why we see folks who are individually working for working with patients at institutions, which are hospitals, and we see Black, Indigenous, Latinx, communities of colors, um, the Pacific Islander community in Washington State dying from COVID at way higher rates. And it's because all of these structures, institutions, and individuals are working together, and it's culturally acceptable within our systems um, to partake in oppression. Jesse, what does that look like uh, within the legislature? I really appreciate your definitions around individual, institutional, and structural. From a legislative standpoint, I would say it's both institutional and structural in a sense, um, and individual. And from, a, from an example, just the other day, actually, we had our public safety committee and um, we had a hearing on my police tactics bill. And there was a black mother who had lost her son to police violence and was sharing her lived experience and, and speaking her truth and uh, spoke about the fact that her son was racially profiled for being black, was stopped by the police and fatally shot under this perception that he posed a serious or imminent threat. Uh, a committee member proceeded to respond with the question to that mother directly, how did she know that he was being stopped for being black? And that no matter why he was stopped, he should have done everything possible to adhere to the demands of those officers. Uh, we know that this comment is insensitive, uh, racist, and not only a microaggression to that mother, but an assault on her in that moment. Um, both myself and another colleague responded directly to the member in the live session that he was out of line, not only in terms of the legal details of the case that was ongoing in civil court, but also neglected to pose any ounce of empathy for that mother who was in pain and putting her on the spot live and in public. And, and that basically with that comment, he reversed the widely understood uh, notion that you are innocent until proven guilty and basically said that that young man was guilty until proven innocent. Um, and so I think from an individual level, we have to begin to address these comments that are being made every day in our institutions, whether you're in education, in healthcare, in housing, um, in, in economic uh, field. It, it's so important that we address this from an in individual level because these are the people that are making policy decisions that will um, uh, basically make policy for our lives that we're in right now. And unless we address it at an inv individual level, it will then proceed to reflect itself and rear its ugly head at an institutional level and a structural level. And so in that moment, knowing that, that's why we had to respond to that person and basically correct what he was saying. You can respect someone's opinion, but you also must uh, correct when you see something that's wrong or hear something that's wrong. And that's what we were doing because again, institutions are built up of individuals that make up the institutions. And it's important that we address the racism in that moment so it doesn't reflect in our policies, practices, and procedures as Epiphany talked about. Thank you, Jesse. And I also agree that sometimes we can't change everyone's heart and it's just the reality of the matter. And so we have to vote for folks who can make policies or promote people who will make HR policies that will hold folks accountable for their racism so that those people aren't able to then make more policies or laws or interact with more folks. So it's all working together, addressing individually, as well as trying to put in policies and structures in place to help move along the folks who don't want to change. Um, and step two, and this one is so important, is understanding the concept of intersectionality and I kind of touched on how they all come into play, all the isms. And the thing about intersectionality, I really want to give honor to this trailblazer, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's an attorney, um, philosopher, leading scholar in critical race theory. And she coined 
this phrase in 1989, so over 31 years ago, she's so ahead of her time. And intersectionality is about how an individual can have multiple identities. And because of these uh, multiple identities, they can face basically different isms and that will impact you know, their life. Something I think I hear a lot um, even now is when people talk about white privilege and someone says, well, I'm poor, I'm, I grew up poor and I'm white and I had no privilege. And so it, it fails to acknowledge uh, the racial privilege that our dominant society due to the structures we touched on um, and the institutions and the way they work basically just lead to better outcomes for folks. And it has nothing to do with their own merit or, or our own merits. And one way I can um, paint this in, from my medical background standpoint is a white woman who is poor and um, has a high school diploma or even less education um, versus a black woman who has a doctorate and has a high income. The black woman is four times more likely to either die in childbirth, have a premature childbirth or additional complications in childbirthing that could possibly take her life or the baby's life. And that is just based off of um, the racism and then also the intersectionality of sexism, but the way that different individuals with different identities experience those things. So um, another thing is if someone, as this example here, um, identifies as queer, uh, trans or non-gender binary, and they have a differential ability or disability and are a woman, then you're marginalized. When you add on that the race factor of being black, queer, um, have a differential ability or disability um, and are maybe femme identifying, then you're adding on more identities that have basically more insults from society, from the structures, from the institutions and from individuals. And that's what intersectionality is about. It's about how multiple identities impact. And we also see this uh, in medicine where black LGBTQAI uh, youth are like having the worst health outcomes out of like any unsheltered youth. And it's because of the intersectionalities of their identities of being black and LGBTQAI plus. And so this is intersectionality. It's, we can never um, take one thing out of the other. They're all combined in how people are experiencing life. And my third and final um, example, which is another health one is folks, we know that um, trans women experience the most gender-based violence in the US. And within that, of the um, trans women who are experiencing and encountering violence, which a lot of times end their lives, 90% of those are black trans women. And so that's the intersectionality between race and gender expression and possibly other things as well that are leading to these outcomes and their disproportionate outcomes. Jesse, anything you'd like to add? I, I think you, you explained it so well. For me, this shows up in the political landscape in terms of the policy and the humanity of others. So if I am black as a, a state representative, how am I showing up for my indigenous community and vice versa? If I am a straight cisgendered male, how am I showing up for my gay, lesbian or trans or, or non-conforming community with love? And, and love and is truth in action because love is a verb, just like we said, hope is a verb. And right now um, we're actually working through this as a state legislature. Uh, for the first time in our legislature's history, we are adding pronouns to bills in our bill language, um, which has never been um, even discussed before. Um, we're also looking at um, every bill that comes through the legislature must have a racial equity impact statement so that we're able to gauge impact of legislation on historically and currently marginalized communities of color. Uh, we have a, a racial equity lens tool that our caucus is beginning to use for all our budget decisions. So these are the critical steps that I believe we must take to be able to move from 
our individual commitments to systemic and institutional and structural action. Thank you, Jesse, for touching on how we can use our different privileges or advantages, even if we have other ways that we are disadvantaged or that we're marginalized, we can still use what privileges we have to stand up for our um, marginalized communities with the lens of intersectionality. So step three in this process for us, we've talked about grounding ourselves in the different levels of oppression. Epiphany touched on intersectionality. And now we move to how we can reach out to marginalized groups and learn to strengthen our community engagement in the process because equity is not just the outcome, but it's the process. So this means that we're centering and elevating the voices of those marginalized in our communities, the, the everyday poor and working class people, uh, black and indigenous people, women of color and so forth. These are the groups that have historically not had a seat at the table from a systemic standpoint. And this is how we also begin to have courageous conversations. We may have conflict and differences and polarities that exist because we can begin to recognize the, the humanity of, of others. Um, however, we have to bring people to the table outside of our own echo chambers. And that's super important. With social media these days, there's so many echo chambers of everyone that may agree on an issue that's together, everyone over here that may agree on an issue and then there's division and fear and polarization, and we must begin to bring those folks together to the table, but it starts again with bringing folks that are most marginalized to the table and then understanding how they're affected by the policies we're discussing. How can our decisions worsen those uh, existing disparities? And how are we intentionally involving the stakeholders so they're not just a voice and we not just are providing a, a microphone, but a platform for that microphone so their voices are elevated. So I uh, just wanted to, to, to you know, touch on that. Um, Epiphany, how does this show up in medicine for you? This shows up so much. And I believe that um, that's what Seeds of BAM, which is a group at UW School of Medicine, which is a group of black students have been trying to work so hard as a marginalized group at UW with changing the way our medical education is because we firmly believe that in changing the way that we're educated in the medical system, that will change the way that doctors are practicing. And that's one of the steps towards decreasing the health disparities that we see. And I think a lot of this goes with, again, folks who have power, folks who have privilege, professors, um, other students, if you have uh, different privileges, especially racial privileges, really holding accountable uh, professors, stakeholders, the administration towards having equitable education and curriculum. And I think it looks like, um, you know, making sure that our teachers aren't doing things like a professor was upset with a student for her correcting him and his um, racism essentially. And she is a African-American student and he called her Rwanda, even though he's known her for over a year and a half instead of her name, which was not Rwanda. And it's like these kind of microaggressions are assaults. We need to make sure that our systems are holding accountable um, anti-Blackness, racism, all the isms, so that our education systems are better. And I think a lot of the times it's folks in community from the marginalized communities having to come and hold the, the folks with power accountable. I think it also looks like people who do have those powers, sometimes folks need to step aside. Like you may be a tenured professor or, you know, whatever kind of supervisory position, but you know, maybe it's time for a black or indigenous or black and indigenous person to come and lead because what we've been doing so far hasn't been working. So I think it involves people getting uncomfortable and in our transformation, giving up some of your power for you to step aside because what you're doing more times than not is not working. Absolutely. We have two more steps here in our process. The fourth step is to uplift and empower community capital. And this is so important once you've reached out to communities, you have these intersections and these broad-based coalitions, and now you must begin to realize their, their capital. And what I mean by capital, a lot of folks think of it as resources or money, which is obviously a factor in this country and across the world. But a lot of times because of disenfranchisement, because of how we've been oppressed, because of 400 plus years of terror and discrimination and racism, 
we have not had uh, resources in terms of uh, financial capital in our communities in terms of uh, other resources, but we do have other types of capital. Um, I'm reminded that the Black National Anthem begins with the quote, lift every voice. The best inside of you can be lifted up along with everyone else. And whatever gifts that you have to give to your community, try to somehow ensure that you're providing those gifts to others so that they themselves can be affirmed. And pouring something out of yourself that others can be enhanced and others are pouring into you, that's how we begin to build our own version of capital. And it becomes a reciprocal process and that is how we can build capital together. So I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, for example, aspirational capital, our ability to maintain hope in the face of obstacles, which is something the Black Lives Matter movement has showed so well this year. Uh, navigational capital, the ability to navigate our institutions and advocate and agitate the system so that we can begin to see policy change. And finally, social capital. How are we developing these broad-based coalitions um, so that it's everyone together, uh, working together so that we can achieve a common goal? So I just wanted to touch on that. That's our fourth step is being able to uplift and empower what we built through the first three steps. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. I was gonna say, I liked when you said agitate because often agitation is a necessity. Um, and it, it reminds me of, you know, right now I would be more of an agitator because I'm a student in the institution at the school, but I'm not holding any power in that in like a different sense of decision-making. And so I'm agitating uh, the administrators and faculty to make some changes. And also we do need folks who are working within the institutions like yourself, making policy um, to work together and also to agitate to make sure the policies you make are implemented. Uh, pardon us, that is our dog. Um, which leads us to the final step, build political will to advocate for equity-based policy at the local, state, and national levels. And I think this basically ties in everything. It starts off with the political will, which I would also call the moral will. Some may say something like a moral compass. It just goes back to when I was speaking about, as a child, I said I wanted to be like MLK. Well, now as a medical student, I said that I was getting into this field and a little bit of my bio stated uh, to help marginalize communities, to help decrease or eliminate uh, health disparities that are formed by these healthcare systems, which are perpetuating these structural, institutional, and individual levels of oppression. And at the end of the day, my will, my vision is tied into, I just wanna see black, indigenous, Latinx, communities of color, PI uh, folks, live. I just want to see them live. If they go into the hospital for COVID, if they go into the hospital for anything or preventative care, I want to know that they are getting the best care and that folks aren't giving them lesser care just because of the color of their skin or because they have pre-conformed uh, preformed ideas that, oh, well, these people aren't compliant. So we're not gonna give them this medication because we should save it for somebody who's compliant. I wanna know that our education system, particularly the medical education system, is teaching physicians what they need to know to help these communities and specifically help these communities um, who have been historically um, experimented on. The Tuskegee syphilis trials saying that they were gonna help folks but infecting them with um, lifetime conditions that could lead to permanent brain damage that could lead to death. And so we see that um, now people are concerned about the vaccine and it's because there's centuries of trauma that have been enforced by these larger systems, including the medical system. And so what we need to continue to do is say, hey, um, I think that this is the right thing to do to help these communities that are dying at disproportionate rates when they should be living. And so what I'm gonna do is disrupt at the local level. So I'm going to um, disrupt at the school level and then I'm going to work with policymakers to make differences in the state um, policies, which there's something going on right now with Senator Randall and then moving to national levels. So it's all going, but starting within ourselves, community and branching out. And I think it's so important 
uh, Jesse has here, plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. And that's what we're doing at the UW School of Medicine as Seeds of BAM. We said, hey, we've been encountering, the, encountering these assaults again and again. So what are we gonna do about it? And you always wanna be strategic because speaking out against it, okay, but what do I want to come out of it? So coming up with that vision, this is what I see medical school education being, or this is what I see my community being and saying, what are the steps that we need to take to get there? Who do I call in? And a lot of that mobilizing includes expanding networks. We can never do it all on our own. We always need help. So many of um, indigenous culture, and I can speak on Pacific Islander culture, is about community and about how we're not apart from ourselves. When Edwina introduced herself, she said not just her name, she said who her mother, her father, her family is, where they're from. And so what we're saying is, I'm not me on my own. We have to let go of the rugged individualism that America or the United States of America teaches us and say, hey, I am from my family. I am from my ancestors. And in this way, we see that we're bound together. We're not standing on our own. And we know that black liberation, indigenous liberation, um, all liberations were tied together. And the more we work in solidarity, the more we can work towards our vision, a vision of indigenous folks having their land back a vision of reparations, a vision of people simply living, being in joy, um, being at peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Epiphany. I know uh, we're gonna wrap up here soon so we could have our 10 minute intermission. And I see two uh, outstanding questions from Corey and Stephanie and if possible would love to get to those questions um, once we return from intermission. But I just wanted to touch briefly on your point around our liberation being bound together. Uh, and I think, you know, as a legislator, I see that the system is really wrestling with the reality that the Black community has experienced in the past 10 months, uh, and that we're standing in pain, and, and not just current pain, but current pain has also triggered past pain, and we're standing in hurt, because as much perceived racial progress that we've had, as I talked about earlier, there's also been this progression of racism, and then we have this incredible show of, of, of spirit and allyship from communities across the globe, really, throughout the summer after we saw the murders of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and people marching in the streets, holding up Black Lives Matter across ethnicities, cultures, and languages, and really connecting um, with humility uh, and, and also tenacity around how we can achieve racial justice and racial e equity and progress. And so that's how our liberation is in fact bound together. And so then we must ask ourselves the question, what is next? How do we move beyond this allyship to co-conspiratorship and, 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 uh, and also accomplice, accomplices so that we can actually achieve racial equity? So in our closing, um, before we go into our intermission, I want us to begin to think about moving forward, what is it gonna take for us to lead in this moment of global uh, racial reckoning? Because each of us in this virtual space has something significant to contribute to making a difference in our society. And you're here for a divine purpose, a reason um, to build and a reason to help our communities. And I just wanna leave us with that question. And we will now go into a eight minute uh, intermission and return at 1 p.m. Thank you, DJ Domar. Um, all right, welcome back family from your break. Um, so this time we'd like to welcome you to our Q&A section, AKA CCIE and Highline's TV show talk with the Johnsons, JK, that last part is not true, but um, I am so thankful I have my co-host, Gio. We are both gonna rotate um, or alternate between some of the questions that folks have posted in the Q&A. If you're still here, um, feel free to also add, add any questions below. Um, and so, Jesse and Epi, um, First question that we have in our Q&A box is, what's the best way to approach a colleague who says microaggressive comments? Uh, that's a great question. I can go ahead and start. Um, you know, I think one of the things that 
I've come to learn in working in a predominantly white institution, such as the legislature and education as well, is that sometimes, uh, you know, what I perceive to be racism, I think a lot of times denial, it, it's like the heartbeat of racism, right? We, we feel like when folks are denying what their assaults are on others, especially in communities of color, it feels so real to us and, and it feels, um, it, it feels like it's bringing up so much pain. And I've also come to, to learn that a lot of it is ill information from the other side. And so um, how do we educate them in that moment? And as someone that, uh, you know, is, is more of a listener, um, I've had to learn to interrupt what I see as, as uh, blatant racism or even small microaggressions. And so that means to maybe, uh, you know, respect an opinion. However, you have to correct them. Like we mentioned in our presentation, we can't let it slide because that can develop. It, it's, it's on us to interrupt that and, and make sure that they're not gonna use that again. And so in a moment like that, I would just say, um, don't, don't, you know, just move to judgment too quickly, listen to what they're saying, but then, um, you know, stop them and, and say that this is how the impact of what they're saying. A lot of times we talk about intent versus impact. This is the impact on the communities of color or whoever is the uh, non-dominant community in that situation that they're making the microaggression for. So again, it, a lot of it is ill information. Like I talked to a former military vet, white male the other day who made the comment to that black mother about her son. And by the end of the conversation, the guy was almost in tears because he did not know what he was saying, how um, racist it was. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, we think that he should know that, but th we're talking about a guy that has never experienced racism, can't even comprehend something like um, individual or institutional or structural racism um, that we talked about in today's presentation. So educating him about that in a conversation where he wasn't gonna get defensive. So it wasn't in public, but it was later in the day when we talked about that is, is really important. Um, Epi might have a different opinion. I know she likes to put people on blast, which is, you gotta do that too sometimes. But hey, I mean, I think, I think it's important to at least try to educate them in a way that they're not gonna get defensive and not listen. I was gonna say, um, I, I'm just gonna be real for this question and answer. First off, that's Jesse. Jesse's nice or whatever. I guess he's being a politician or, you know, a bridge builder diplomat. First off, I don't respect their opinion whatsoever. <laughs> okay, no. And then second off, um, it's hard because whoever answered the question, I know that's what we said to do. And it is the right thing. And it's especially good. Somebody said, how can... Um, like somebody with privilege be or privilege be utilized by allies in black and brown movements. And I think that a couple things about the microaggression. First off, sometimes I'm so stunned by things people say, especially when I'm like at school, like trying to focus, I'm about to go see a patient or something and somebody says something wild and you're just like, no, they did not just say that. That it's just like, how do I even respond? And so sometimes you just be like, you don't say anything and you keep it moving and you just be like, what, did you hear that? But hopefully we can get to a point where we get used to addressing things. Some, like sometimes I have been able to do it like on the spot. Sometimes it's just like, I would like to say for the folks who are basically like directly being impacted by the microaggression, it's good for them to not have to be the ones to address it. So that's where the privilege comes in because it's like you're being assaulted by the microaggression. And yes, the term is microaggression, but it's an, in, it's an assault. So it, it can cut so deeply. The way that the term was phrased was like these things that people say, and it seems like a small thing, but it really is not. It's just the way the term was coined. It's like, you can still die a death by a thousand cuts. And it's like, it's these microaggressions that lead to folks having hypertension it's the chronic stress of racism that is microaggressions and these other things um, that leads to bad health outcomes for folks. So it's never like their race that is, it's the racism they're facing that make them more predisposed to have um, these outcomes. I would say one thing that uh, my therapist told me too was to ask them a question about it. So like one time somebody said something so wild about South Center in like a clinical setting he said it was like a ghetto 
because it was just like all Asian. And I was like, that's, he's like, you know, it's so such a strange place. And I was just like, it's strange that you just said that. And like, that's all that I could get out at the moment. <laughs> and like the teacher was looking like this. And afterwards I told her, you know, you should have said more. She's like, what could I have done? And then she's like, well, I didn't want to. And then I'm just like, why'd you even ask me if you weren't going to do what I told you? But just like making a comment, something like, you know, that's not okay. Or why do you think you can say that? Another way to do it, if you really want to be a little bit more diplomatic, like Representative Johnson, is ask a follow-up question like, so you said this, so like, what did you mean by that? And then they'll kind of get into a, so spinning around in their tail and may, hopefully they'll uncover for themselves that what they said was jacked up. But if not, it might lead to this. I am also a believer that um, people from um, marginalized communities don't have to educate people. Like we don't owe people anything. And so I could just read you out and be like, you're being racist because blah, 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 um, and leave. Like, and I don't wanna hear nothing you gotta say. And also for building community, sometimes it's good. You also have to kind of base it off of what your atmosphere is. Cause I'm not, I said something about like, you could lose monetary things. Like if it's your supervisor, you might wanna be strategic or something about how you go about it. Or if it's your professor and they're in charge of your grade, you know, you might just wanna be reporting them to whatever the special anonymous thing is on the down low because you don't wanna get a bad grade. So I'm saying um, try to be strategic and choose a plan wisely. I hope that makes sense. It does, thank you. So um, your next question is, how can, we be how can we be better advocates with ourselves and our family? For example, my doctor seemed to take me seriously, but based on years of treatment for chronic conditions, it's become clear over time that they don't use appropriate treatment until I've kept coming and the severity has increased. I'm so sorry to hear this. This is exactly the stuff I'm talking about, Stephanie. Um, I hate this because we shouldn't have to be fighting so hard to be advocates so hard for our family, but it really is necessary from what I've seen and experienced within the medical system. Um, a couple of thoughts is, uh, gosh, it sucks because basically one thing is to do research, which I'm sure you've probably already done how you know that they're not using the treatment necessary. And like, maybe that might become from like support group for whatever this chronic condition is and trying to do medical research. I know it's basically like Googling to see what the standard treatment is. Um, and then from there, like using that information when talking with the doctor, doctors, I'm gonna, you know, honest to be honest, and this is really gonna take me down a little road, to me, doctors are like a lot like police officers. Like we're literally trained as physicians in training to like cover each other's back and never say if somebody gave a patient the wrong thing or made a mistake. It's like, oh, don't say anything. Like just smile and mind your business and keep going. So that's interesting. But I guess it's like, try to do as much research as you can to be as knowledgeable as you can, which really isn't what we as like individuals should have to be doing. And then I was gonna say, this one's tough, is um, if you know anybody in the medical system, try to leverage that. Cause sometimes they'll basically treat you better if like, you know, a doctor or a nurse or like even a technician, like anybody that works at a hospital and then also can report them like anonymously. And also I'm a firm like, person of, I don't know what the insurance capacity is for you, but switching doctors. I also like the idea of like trying to find a doctor that I might have cultural concordance with being like, they might be black or Samoan, or I might look them up and I'm just like, it feels like we might vibe. It may or may not happen because unfortunately not all skin folk are kin folk, but sometimes that can be a good place to start. Um, so those are the things is like, try to be knowledgeable because Unfortunately, if doctors think that you know things, usually they'll act better because they'll think, oh, this person can hold me accountable, which is like, that's how we should all be acting from the get-go is giving the best care to everybody. Um, and I've heard this 
like with one of my friends who's in my medical school class, her mom has high blood pressure and apparently the doctor wasn't like upping her medications and was just like, oh, she doesn't know how to take her blood pressure properly. And that's why the numbers are high or she doesn't even do it every day. Her mom does it every day. She went with her to an appointment and was like, I'm a medical student at UW. And then the doctor like started prescribing new blood pressure medication when she started asking questions. So I know it's tough because before now, I didn't really have anybody to be like, oh, I'm gonna talk to my uncle at Valley Med or something. Like, I don't have any people. I've met like two Samoan doctors in my whole life. Um, so if you know someone to lean on that and just to try to hold them accountable. And I see the also follow up about um, the depression statement and it, it kind of cracked me up in the sense that I went to an appointment yesterday and the medical system was like, are you depressed? And in my mind, mind you, I'm a medical student. I was like, and if I was, I wouldn't tell you, but like, <laughs> we should be opening up. But I was just like, if you're just asking me, we're really supposed to be asking different questions. Like, have you been feeling like you don't wanna do things you enjoy in these things? Um, it just basically, it all comes down to for being our best advocates are doing research as to what kind of treatments our folks should actually be getting. What does mental health illness look like? So that hopefully we can identify it within our own families and move towards, you know, oh, it's time for us to, you know, talk with a therapist. And it's so hard. And it's something I've experienced within my own family life where we didn't know that these were the signs of mental health illness until it was like really far down the line but doing our best to educate ourselves and maybe even move providers if insurance allows. Um, we have to be like, if you're not gonna give us the treatment we need, I'm moving along and hope to find a better person and keep moving until you find the people you need. All right, Dr. Epi, I'll be reaching out to you in the future. I'm like, uh, sis, what do you think about this report? But um, our next question that we have for you, I know you kind of like touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, one of the questions is how can privilege be utilized by allies to help in black and brown uh, movements? I can go ahead and lead us off with that. I think uh, what we saw this year was an incredible showing of uh, allyship, but we wanna move towards uh, being an accomplice and that's um, really making sure that you're leveraging resources, either material resources, either networking resources, or giving up something to help the cause for someone else. And I think that's what white folks can do in this moment, uh, because I think you know we have a lot of, of, of folks that wanna stand in solidarity and there's this mention of how can I be an ally? How can I be in solidarity? And in order to move towards what we talked about with racial equity action, we have to give up something for someone else in that moment. That's that's how it's gonna have to work because we are in a moment where people are being literally um, disregarded in public health and educational setting in, uh, in criminal justice reform uh, and so on. And, we don't have people standing up and clapping back either through social media or in a real way to say, hey, we got to stop this. We got to end this. We have to literally look at ourselves in the mirror and, and say, what can we do from our individual standpoint uh, to leverage resources for uh, other communities? And so that's just something I would say, because we can disrupt uh, racism in so many ways and, and be um, and out, uh, accomplice and use our privilege. Um, and, and same goes for, for other levels of intersectionality like we talked about earlier, as a cisgender uh, straight male, what can I do to leverage my privilege? Uh, and so there's just so many ways that we can look at ourselves in the mirror and leverage either time, money, resources, or some type of actual uh, you know, thing that we can do beyond just saying, you know, oh yeah, we stand in solidarity. So I would just say that figuring that out in your own individual life is super important. Uh, I agree and would like to add on um, really taking a look and that involves introspective introspection to say, what are my privileges? And Jesse kind of gave us an example. I think making sure that we're allowing the folks or the communities we're wanting to serve to be the leaders and so basically one thing is going up to folks and be like, 
I want to do something to help you all. What do you, what could I do? What like literally asking folks, like usually there's people that you see, either they usually speak up or you see an organization form or something like that, that's speaking up against something. And you say, maybe even, Hey, these are my skills or talents. Like I'm good at writing and editing, or I'm good at um, web design. Like I, I, whatever you all want, I'm in like, try not to take credit for stuff, just like know that you're there to help. And these folks are leading for their own liberation. Um, that That's the major thing is like letting the folks lead. And I think also another way I feel like with racial equity is, you know, when you see something that's gone wrong and if someone speaks up, please um, agree with them in front of all the people that they've spoken up against and don't text them or DM them after the fact, like, I agree with you because that's doing absolutely nothing to help them. Um, it would be nice if you would be the one to speak up. And also if someone is speaking up, be publicly out in front with them because that helps. And the thing about privilege is usually the folks that we're speaking up against you know, addressing microaggressions or what so have you are folks with privilege and they usually somehow tend to respect other people with privilege or other folks that, that they more so identify. So that could help because I can't help who someone, you know, takes their word over mine. But if this other person speaks up and then the people are like, oh, well, I do respect that person's opinion or that person's like me. So maybe I should think about it. It really helps to speak up in person, in public. All right, thank you. Um, your next question, um, I guess this is more for um, Jesse. Um, we can imagine the challenges Jesse has faced on his road to being a black politician in the state of Washington. My question is, what are some of your favorite success stories along the way? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, that's from my good friend, Delon. Good to see you on here, Delon. Um, I think, being in politics, uh, you know, one of the things I talked about when I first ran for city council was increasing um, our community's seat at the table and increasing our ability to be able to transform, transform the system. Um, and I think what I've seen since, um, at least in my own hometown in Federal Way, is uh, we saw so many more uh, young people, communities of color at city council meetings that were engaging in the process. Um, we had a record number of people come out to vote this year, a record number of black women and women of color elected this year. Uh, we increased actually our black members caucus from four to nine members. And that's not all attributed to myself, obviously, but I think it has been a process of just seeing, when we see one of us, uh, we, we begin to think that we can see more of us um, at the table. And that has been awesome to see. Just this year, we had over 80 young adults that are in the juvenile justice system registered to vote for the first time for this election um, right here in Washington State. And these are young people that have been disenfranchised um, since they were in school, um, put into the school to prison pipeline, and they're now registered to vote and um, voted this year for the first time in their life. And that was incredible because voting is that first step kind of in our journey of, of activism process, um, but there's so much more to do beyond that. And to be able to see those young folks um, have their voice heard and really make a difference as we saw across the state in the country, um, that was a success story, I think. Uh, also, I would just say, um, you know, beginning to at least see some progress in closing opportunity gaps like we had our, um, our state voted for an equity office last year that we're fully funding, hopefully this year for the first time. Uh, we're talking about you know, things like digital equity and how do we get laptops to uh, young kids in communities of color that don't have access to laptops and broadband access. We're making progress on police reform and accountability this year, although we'll have to see how far we can go with it. Um, and so I think we're just making the right steps and 2021, I think, is going to be a year in which we see the system being challenged for, in ways that we've never seen before because we have so many people at the table, not only in terms of the seat 
itself in the legislature, but in the community that are engaged, young people that have a vision for what they want to see in the world, and they're engaged in the process. And I'm just really excited about that. And it makes me want to keep going and keep furthering our cause um, in the legislature. So I would just say those are just a couple examples, but it's been a it's been a great time and an honor really to be in this position to help our community. That's awesome, Jesse. Um, I know folks are probably still thinking of some more questions, um, but I have a question for you too. Um, this is more, you know, thinking about you two as a couple. What is your, what would, how do you two practice self care as a couple? And then also like, or maybe like, what is your favorite date night? So welcome to the TV show part of our Q and A. Well, for it, Jesse would love for me to answer this question. Look at how excited he is. Um, he's like, hype me up, babe. But <laughs> I just want to say I do love hearing how excited Jesse is. Uh, to do the work that he's doing, serving community, and especially working with youth, which has always been at the forefront. Um, I It makes worth standing out on the corner with a sign in the cold weather worth it <laughs> in the morning at 6 a.m. I think my we do a lot of Netflix binging or Hulu, like we're watching Prison Break right now. Um, and I'm into this new show called Sirens. You know, I love anything with the ocean. You know, Edwina, it's an interesting one. It's about mermaids. It's on um, Hulu. There's one based off of like the one of the Australian coasts um, on Netflix, but I don't know. My brother got me into it, but we watch TV to decompress at night, like at least by nine usually. But my favorite date night or date day, whichever that Jesse plans for us is when he books us um, massages at Salish Spa and pre-COVID, they could be couples fireside massages, but I love a good massage and it's always sweet and we get to go over there. And I like being, um, it's all indigenous land, but I like being like by the Snoqualmie waterfall and like, you know, I can't be in Samoa. So I'm like getting in touch with water somewhere. So I love that because it always feels so like before I go and put on the robe and before COVID could like go to the hot tub, the steam room. So we would make our little rotation before with a little mimosa. And um, yeah, it was one of my favorite things to do. I love that. Uh, I think uh, for me, I love the, the fact that Epi has been like such a big support in the political space because that's not always easy on the partner like it's it's a lot like you see like all these like crazy messages that are being sent to me on Facebook or other social media platforms from community and, and yeah uh, you know she she keeps her her lips uh, sealed pretty good on that because that's difficult but um, she's a, been a big support um, in terms of date night I'm pretty simple I love when we could just order in some takeout, watch a basketball game or a football game on TV. I'm a pretty fanatic uh, sports fan. So uh, I know that Effie kind of gets annoyed with that sometimes, but she sits through the game. She'll watch the Lakers with me, uh, watch my guy LeBron. And, you know, that's a great date night. It's just, it's just something simple like that. <laughs> Jesse's lucky that his guy's LeBron. I really kind of only sit through it because it's LeBron and I love what he does with the community. Oh, somebody said storm over Lakers. True, true, true. Sue Bird, right? All right. Uh, Edwina, do you have any questions for them? Like, my next question is, or I guess, like, for our attendees, do you all have any other questions? You know, feel free to use a chat button or the chat feature. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but while we're waiting for them, my question is like, with you both having very different um, respected um, fields, you know, politics and um, medical field, like how do you see yourself working along each, along each other, you know, like towards, um, I guess like equity, really um, build that community. I'll start off and I'll let Je Jesse finish us off with a nice bow. I think, um, something I've seen and it's from watching Jesse live his life and be out in community as a city council person than the state rep is that I think the biggest way that we'll be working together to serve community 
because I can have all these ideas about making policies and regarding medicine. I think the biggest thing is being on the ground too with community, like in person, showing up for different events or providing um, resources um, in person. I think a lot of like community work and supporting community is done kind of like on the ground work. And it brings me back to tie in the thing about privilege. Like I'm thinking eventually when I'm making more, we'll also be like working to redistribute some of our funds and income towards community too. And that's like my only main goal in making more money in life is to redistribute to community who needs it. Um, but I think working on the grounds a lot and then hopefully eventually some kind of policy work maybe. Um, Jesse, what do you foresee? Uh, I, I think because uh, we have such specific focuses between politics and medicine, like having some type of foundation that can benefit community, um, similar to what Epi said, just something that works together for our communities. Also, um, being that, you know, I'm Black, Epi's Black and Samoan, like really focusing in on those two communities specifically, but then benefiting everyone through that targeted universalism. Again, everyone look that up, Dr. John Powell. But uh, that's really important. And then also doing something we enjoy. I'm a huge like, coffee fan and I love working out. So I kind of want to open a gym with like a cool coffee stand and like smoothie stand and investing in that for community to come in at a low cost and like young kids that can't afford to go to LA Fitness or whatever, one of these other gyms. So that's something I'm really passionate about too. And just combining like our passions with our professional careers and doing something that we enjoy and we feel um, excited to go to work every day. Thank you. I think Edwina has a lot more questions. I know you're, you're, you're looking for the team. No, I'm not. I mean, yes, I can ask you all the questions all day, but I was going to say, Jesse, when you open up that gym slash cafe, I have barista skills. So what's up? Like, can I get a oh, part-time yeah. job there? I'm just like, okay. Can I get I you. I'm oh. manager. Oh, oh, snaps. Okay. I'm and I know Doris. <laughs> yes, Doris is saying, yeah, we need that in federal way. Um, we are coming up to like the end of our time. I can't believe it's already 1130 because like I said earlier, like we could just like sit here and soak up so much knowledge from the both of you. I know our community at Highline. Um, I know our team is like, you know, hashtag relationship goals, the Johnsons. But, um, you know, there's just so much that we have learned from the both of you today for our community who's still here. Um, I know some folks had questions about the recording. We will be posting um, all of our MLK events on our CCIE page, as well as our Highline YouTube channel. Um, but we want to say thank you to our community for joining us today with the Johnsons. We also want to say thank you, of course, Jesse and Epi, just for everything that you shared with our community and for all the work that you two are doing um, locally. You know, like it's just so amazing that we can have these conversations with the two of you. Um, and now, folks, you know, you know who's who's um, local, you know, you know, Dr. Epi, you know, if you have questions for her, you know, ask those questions, but also make sure, you know, you show some love to her as well. Um, but we wanted to say thank you both again. Folks, please fill out our feedback form, which our moderators are posting in the chat. Um, Doris is asking, how can we reach y'all? Oh yeah, if you have like an email, um, how can folks get in touch with the both of you? If you can put that in the chat, Epi and Jesse. That would be wonderful. Um, I had one more question. No, I don't have one more question because time is up, Edwina, so you can't. We'll just have to talk on the side. But yeah, Epi just posted her email. I, I think Jesse's gonna post his email as well. Um, tonight, folks, today is not over for MLK Week. Uh, join us later on this afternoon at 4.30 to 6. Um, Speaking of more, we have some more um, local leaders. Um, we have Cynthia De Los Trinos, who works with our Tequila community, um, who's gonna be hosting a conversation on the first, but not the last, a call for new leaders. So please join us. It's been wonderful having you all here in the space. And of course, tomorrow in closing our MLK week, um, we have Lydia Brown. So thank you all once again for being here. Uh, thank you, Epi and Jesse, and yeah, and we'll see you all soon.